That's very nice. You know, when Rod gets up here, he has to yell. <laughs> Welcome. Glad you're all here at uh, Ridge Chapel this morning. Uh, I'm not Rod, but I'm James. So uh, I welcome each one of you here and uh, hope you're here to, to praise the Lord. And uh, as far as uh, announcements go, just refer to uh, Facebook or they were scrolling up there on the screen. Um, I take, check the uh, calendar and I think we're, uh, we're good until the first part of February and the first week of February, I believe, is uh, potluck. So keep that in mind. Um, that's all the announcements we have. Let's stand together and we'll do our uh, call to worship this morning. <clears throat> From Psalms 25, 4 through 5, read it with me. Show me your ways, O Lord. Teach me your paths. Guide me in your truth and teach me. For you are my God, my Savior, and my hope is in you all day long. All right, let's sing together. <clears throat> Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. Unto thee, O Lord, do I lift up my soul. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Yea, let none that wait on me be ashamed. Yea, let none that wait on me be ashamed. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. Show me thy ways, thy ways, O Lord. Teach me thy paths, thy paths, O Lord. O my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed, let not mine enemies triumph over me. Remember not the sins of my youth. Remember not the sins of my youth. Oh, my God, I trust in thee. Let me not be ashamed. Let not mine enemies triumph over me. seated. <clears throat> the psalm before the Lord's Supper meditation this morning is going to be Lead Me to Calvary. <clears throat> King of my life, I crown thee now, thine shall the glory be. Lest I forget thy thorn crown brow, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. Let me like Mary through the gloom come with a gift to thee. Show to me now the empty tomb, lead me to Calvary. Lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me, lead me to Calvary. May I be willing, Lord, to bear daily my cross for thee. Even thy cup of grief to share, thou hast borne all for me. 
lest I forget Gethsemane, lest I forget thine agony, lest I forget thy love for me. Lead me to Calvary. Morning. Morning. That was an extremely fitting song for the message that I've got today. As we read through the Bible, we find a lot of fascinating stories about people just like us, uh, people with worry and pain, but also hope and joy, people with failures and setbacks, as well as victories and achievements. Take Joseph, for instance, betrayed by his brothers and sold into slavery. I can't imagine the pain he must have felt. Yet his integrity and his confidence in God were unwavering. Therefore, what others meant for evil, God used for good. And through him, God saved many people from starvation, including his brothers. Moses is another one, unsure of himself and hot-tempered at times. Moses had the tremendous task of being God's messenger to a hard-hearted Pharaoh, pleading with him to let God's people go and through diligence and faithfulness, the great exodus took place, and God was able to save his people. How about Jonah? Very reluctant and opinionated, there was no doubt that he was very much against going to Nineveh. He downright hated them. But even though Jonah tried to run away from God's calling, eventually he gave in. And he submitted to God's will. And because of that, an entire city repented and was spared. Each of us has a story to tell, whether it be how God saved us or how he used us to save others. But if we humble ourselves and really look at the stories, we realize something very interesting. That is that we aren't the point of the story. Jesus is. When we make the decision to follow Christ, we stop living for ourselves. And instead, we live so that others may be saved. In Matthew 16, verse 25, Jesus says this, Whoever wishes to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake, we'll find it. That's what these three men did. They chose to lay down their lives in service to God. And in doing so, God was able to use them as a vessel to save his people. That's the purpose of our lives, is to point others to Jesus so that they might be saved. To make his story known, not ours. Through his death, burial, and resurrection, we are saved from God's wrath and forgiven of our sins. It is this sacrifice from our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, that even allows us to have a working relationship with God. And as we partake of the bread, which represents his broken body, and the cup, which represents his shed blood, it is this sacrifice that we must never forget. It is the point of God's story, so let it be the point of ours. Let's take the bread. And the cup. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you we thank you for sending your son as a sacrifice for us to do what we could never do, to forgive us our sins, our transgressions, and to give us a relationship with you. May we point others to Jesus, to the saving grace that you offer, Lord. 
It is in Jesus' name that we pray. Amen. During the song, I guess the uh, if we have any youngins, be dismissed to junior church this time. <clears throat> Fill my cup, Lord. Like the woman at the well, I was seeking for things that could not satisfy. And then I heard my Savior speaking, draw from my well that never shall run dry. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up and make me whole. There are millions in this world who are craving the pleasures earthly things afford. But none can match the wondrous treasure that I find in Jesus Christ my Lord. Fill my cup, Lord, I lift it up, Lord. Come and quench this thirsting of my soul. Bread of heaven, feed me till I want no more. Fill my cup, fill it up, and make me whole. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You know, the Bible says that we are wondrously made. As I get older, the more and more I realize that. Uh, now, for years, at this time of the year, I, my eyes water, and I, well, and my nose drips. And so I figured that so I've got some kind of a sinus problem. And each year I go and get shots or get medicine to take care of my sinus problem or my allergy problem. And then finally this year they decided, no, that's not the problem at all. That there's a duct in my eye where they should drain my eye so that my eyes don't water. But it's blocked up, and so the water somehow makes its way to my nose, and it's all my eyes' fault <laughs> why my nose drips. Well, that's nice, but I want you to know that you're going to see me do that probably quite often in my sermon. Now, there's a second thing I, want, I need to mention, and I think most of you know it, that our elders have, as I've, well, because of my age and condition, our elders have made it possible for me to have one Sunday per month in which I don't preach, that I can just relax. And today is Rod's Sunday. <laughs> But this week, Rod came down with COVID. And so he called me to tell me that and to decide who we could ask to preach. Well, you know, that's a kind of a dirty thing to do to somebody 
at the last minute to have him get ready for a sermon. So I told him, well, I'll preach. And I began working on a sermon. A little bit late, but I started working on it. And, well, like I usually do, I end up with a lot more notes than I want to have in my sermon. And, of course, what I usually do is begin boiling it down and boiling it down and uh, then ending up with my sermon. Now, I, when I first began on this sermon, or on my sermon uh, for this week, I had nine pages of small type notes. And I began trying to boil it down. And after a full day of trying to boil it down, I had eight pages <laughs> of notes. And that was still twice too many. So I told my wife, well, I'm going to give you my sermon and let you tell me what I ought to leave out and what I ought to change. Now, I do that quite often, and she's good at it. But at the same time, I decide to see what some of my some preachers have to say about this same scripture, because I'm trying to tie in with our Sunday school lesson. Well, as I did, I came across a sermon by uh, Jeff Strite of Indiana uh, that I thought was a pretty good sermon. So I laid mine aside and began working on his. And I changed it and adapted it and cut it and added to it and, and uh, outlined it and then finally made PowerPoints for it. So this morning, if you appreciate this message, praise the Lord and thank Jeff Stripe. <laughs> if you don't appreciate the message, praise the Lord anyway and blame me for all the changes I made in it. But we're talking about John the 17th chapter today. And, uh, well, to begin with, though, children have some very simple views on various topics. When I come across some, I like to share them. And so here are a few of their views on the subject of love. A seven-year-old said, if falling in love is anything like learning how to spell, I don't want to do it. <laughs> it takes too long. A five-year-old boy said, once I'm in kindergarten, I'm going to find me a wife. <laughs> David, age eight, stated, love will find you even if you are trying to hide from it. I've been trying to hide from it since I was five, but the girls keep finding me. <laughs> a six-year-old, six-and-a-half-year-old, observed, I think you're supposed to get shot with an arrow or something. But the rest of it isn't supposed to be so painful. <laughs> I think he watches too many comic strips. And finally, when someone loves you, the way they say your name is different. You know that your name is safe in their mouth. Now, I like that one. Today we are talking about love, and in this case, we're going to be talking about the love that Christ has for us as his church. In John, the 17th chapter, is the longest recorded prayer of Jesus. 
in any of the Gospels. And I don't sense that Jesus is praying like he's some kind of a religious leader. I sense that he's not praying just like, I, th I sense that he is praying just like a husband would pray for his wife and family that he loves. With the depth of emotion, he is praying for his, ap his apostles and for us. In Ephesians, the fifth chapter, the 26th verse, Paul tells husbands to love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Now, did you catch that? Christ loves the church. That's his bride. He gave himself up for her. It's a passionate and sacrificial love. So I picture Jesus pouring his whole heart into these words because this prayer is important. But what's so important about this prayer? Why would Jesus bother to pray to his Father about the things that he prays for here? Well, we need to remember that in less than a day after this prayer, Jesus will die on the cross. He's in the Garden of Gethsemane with his apostles. Then he's going to be buried in a tomb. And three days later, he will rise from the dead. And 40 days after that, he will go up into heaven and he'll not come back until the end of the ages. Jesus will be physically gone and the church will be pretty much in the hands of his followers. And when that happens, dangers will arise. So in the prayer, just hours before his crucifixion, Jesus prayed to the Father to protect the church with his Holy Spirit from those dangers. Now you get the picture. Now the source of those dangers is our arch enemy, someone called the evil one, or Satan. Jesus prayed, I do not ask that you take them out of the world, but that you keep them from the evil one. Now, we do have an enemy. And the closest, and he doesn't like us. In fact, he intends to destroy us. Now, here's where this watery eye gets me because I can't see either. <laughs> okay. Uh, Revelation, the 12th chapter, the 17th verse, says, the dragon, that's Satan, became furious with the woman. That's the church. And went off to make war on the rest of her offspring. In other words, the Christians. On those who keep the commandments of God and hold to the testimony of Jesus. Now, Satan's intention is to take us out. He hates God, and he hates God so much that it is his personal agenda to destroy us 
because we're precious to God. We're loved by Jesus. And Satan figures if he can take us out, he can hurt Jesus, and that would be his vengeance against God. Now, I want you to understand, boy, I'm really having a problem. Excuse me. I want you to understand that Satan is real. But not everyone believes that. Several years ago, the New York Times reported a survey that asked Americans if they agreed to this statement. And the statement is, Satan is not a living being, but just a symbol of evil. And two-thirds of those who were questioned agreed with that statement. But Satan is not just a symbol of evil. He's quite real. And he is a powerful adversary. There's an old Chinese saying or proverb, know your enemy. Now, know your enemy, know your enemy's tactics, and know his objectives. Because if you don't know your enemy, you'll be an easy target and he will take you down. Now that's why Peter warned us, be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls about like a roaming lion seeking someone to devour. And Paul warned us in Ephesians 6, 11, and 12. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. Now, folks, I've got to stop for a second. This is really bothering me. But I want you to know that I have a... Uh, appointment with the eye doctor this week and they're going to do surgery on my eye to hopefully to solve this problem. Okay, now going on. <laughs> <laughs> For we do not rest, wrestle against flesh and blood but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So we need to remember that Satan is real and that he is powerful opponent. But here is the deal, and all oh, this is wonderful. Satan can't capture or destroy us if you and I stay close to God. In 1 John 5.18, we're told, we know that everyone who has been <coughs> excuse me, born of God does not keep on sinning. <coughs> Boy, Maybe Rod should have preached instead of me. <laughs> oh. Let me start over again with what? <laughs> what John wrote. He says, we know that everyone who has been born... <laughs> Maybe Satan doesn't want me to read that scripture. <laughs> okay. We know that everyone who has been born of God <coughs> does not.
does not keep on sinning, but he who was born of God, and that's Jesus, protects him. <laughs> and the evil one does not touch him. As long as you and I stay close to God, Satan cannot control us. Now, I hope you got that point despite all my problems. So the first focus of Jesus' prayer was that the Father keep us close to him and safe from the evil one. Now, let's go on with the prayer in the 17th chapter. The second focus of his prayer was to use the truth to make us holy or separate or different. Jesus prayed, use the truth to make them holy. Your word is truth. Now, why is that important? Well, Jesus said in John the 8th chapter and the 44th verse, when Satan lies, now listen to this, when Satan lies, he speaks his native language. For he is a liar and the father of lies. Thus, one of the most important things that can protect us from Satan is Scripture. Scripture is truth and Satan is a liar. And it's our best weapon against his tactics. Remember the time Satan tried to tempt Jesus in the wilderness? Satan tried three different times, three different temptations on Jesus. But none of them worked. Every time Satan tried to tempt him, Jesus began his response with three words, began it with the three words. It is written. Written? Where is it written? It's written in the Bible. All right, let's see. Jesus answered Satan's three temptations. It is written, man shall not live by bread alone. That's the first temptation. Again, it is written, you shall not put the Lord your God to the test. That was for the second temptation. And again, it is written, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you worship. Satan wanted to get Jesus into a selfish debate. But Jesus wasn't going to go there. All Jesus had to do was quote scripture. That is, quote what God said. And the argument was over. And do you know why? Because when you quote God's word, you're quoting God. And you can't get a higher uh, authority than that. God said in Isaiah 55, 10 and 11, for as the snow, for as the rain and snow come down from heaven and do not return there but water the earth, making it bring forth and sprout, giving seed to the sower and bread to the eater, so shall my word be that goes out from my mouth. It shall not return to me empty, but it shall accomplish that which I purpose and shall succeed in the thing for which I sent it. No matter how clever any man or woman may be or may have been throughout history, none of them have uttered words that have the power to do what God's word can do.
God's word is truth and it's powerful. That's why Hebrews 4.12 tells us the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of the soul and spirit, of joints and marrow, and determining and discerning the thought and intentions of the heart. Now, boy, some of the articles written by some of modern religious experts, so-called, um, well, go something like this. You see what they say. Quote, a simple reading of the Bible says that such and such a miracle occurred. But, and then the article goes on to explain why the Bible is wrong. In other words, they're saying, I know that's what the Bible says, but that's not what it means. Have you been in a class or group or heard someone say that? Satan's been using that tactic for centuries. When he tempted Eve in the Garden of Eden, Satan said, did God really say, don't eat? And you must not eat from any tree in the garden? That's not what God said. And then he went on to twist the truth and convince her she was wrong and implied that God had lied to her. Now, if Eve had simply said, God said it, I believe it, and that settles it, she had been all right, okay. But she abandoned God's word for Satan's lies. Don't let Satan do that to you. Hang on to God's word. Now the third point from this chapter. Christ prayed for unity in his church. The last focus in this prayer is Jesus' prayer because of his love. I do not ask for these only, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me, and I in you, that they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. Jesus prayed that we would be in unity. One church with one message and one Savior. Now, or as Ephesians 4, verses 5 and 6 says, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all. One of Satan's objectives is to destroy our unity, to divide us, because he knows that a unified church is his worst nightmare. Satan knows that he can't do much damage to a church that's united. So the, his objective is to create division in the body of Christ, his church. Now, about three years after Jesus rose from the dead and ascended back into heaven, the early church experienced 
a divisive spirit and split. There was conflict over whether Gentiles, that's you and me, should be circumcised. That is, to follow Jewish customs to be saved. And even though God said circumcision was no longer required, a group of Jewish believers went about demanding their own way. And down through the ages, there have been repeated divisions in the church. Until now in the U.S., there are over 250 different denominations. Well, actually a whole lot more than that, but 250 recognized denominations. Now, I don't have much hope of unifying all those different denominations under the Lordship of Christ. But how about individual congregations that have a hard time staying together? How about local congregations? Now let me tell you this story. And it's a true story. The story is told of a church in Tennessee back in the early 1900s that had a terrible split. But neither side could afford to leave and build their own building, church building. So both groups still continued to meet and worship in the same building at different times, but would have nothing to do with each other. Now, the story goes on to say that the building was heated by coal. And there was a storage building behind the church building that sheltered the coal. And someone posted this sign over that storage building. One Lord, one faith, two coal piles. <laughs> well, I'm not sure anyone knows how to undo all the divisiveness in all the different churches. But you and I can do what's necessary to make sure there's no divisiveness here in Ridge Chapel. And I know we can maintain that unity by taking very seriously this attitude. No creed but Christ, no book but the Bible, and no law but love. Now let me explain. No creed but Christ. Our faith hinges on the fact that Jesus is Lord. He is our Lord. He bought us and owns us. This is not our church, not the elders, not the preachers, or it belongs to him. And we, you and I, are responsible to Christ to make sure we do things here that honor him. Secondly, no book but the Bible. We are unified behind the idea that where the Bible speaks, we speak. And where the Bible is silent, we're silent. Now, where the Bible is silent, we can have our own personal opinions. But we don't have the right 
to force our personal opinions upon anyone else. Of course, I'm right always, but <laughs> so I'm not. I'm just like you. We have our own personal opinions about things. But we don't have the right as Christians to force opinions upon others. Now, why is that important? Because the Bible is God's word, and it is the truth. And we will not allow any human teaching to undermine that fact. Third, no law but love. Now, this is the tough one, because people do get upset with one another. That's reason for so many church divisions and splits. The reason that church, church had two coal piles was because somebody forgot that we need to love one another. Jesus said, a new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so you must love one another. And that's such an important command that it's repeated several times in the New Testament. James, the second chapter, the eighth verse says, it is the royal law of the kingdom. But what does that mean? It means that if you're upset with a brother or sister, you, you go and make it right. Did you realize that most churches don't split over theology? More often, congregations are torn apart because of conflict between people. It's those conflicts can escalate because others take sides. When such evil behavior takes place, Satan wins. That's why Jesus taught in the Sermon on the Mount, if you're bringing your gift to God and remember that a brother has anything against you, don't bother with the gift. Leave the gift, go make things right with your brother. Then you can give to God, otherwise God's not interested. Now here's a true story about a young man named George. Now I changed the name. Who wanted to become a preacher. So his home church helped make it possible financially for him to go to Bible college. When he completed his studies, he returned to his home church with an attitude of I know everything. Well, you know, there are people like that. And he promptly began openly complaining about the preacher, let's call him Frank, and the way Frank did things. In time, George was called to be the minister of a church two states away and settled into his ministry with excitement. But then he began to find people who were treating him the way that he had treated Frank. Well, that really bothered him. 
And the more he encountered this mistreatment, the more convicted he was about his previous behavior towards Frank. Then one day, George heard that Frank had been hospitalized back home. And he knew what he had to do. He got in his car, drove a distance back to his hometown, and went directly to the hospital. He found Frank's room, entered and visited with his old preacher for a while. And then he asked if he could pray for him. Literally in tears, George laid his hands on Frank and prayed for him. And then he begged Frank's forgiveness for his behavior years before. Frank smiled and said, it's okay. I forgave you a long time ago. And that, with George, returned home a different and happier man. Now that is what loving one another looks like. A willingness to humble ourselves with people we've mistreated or forgiving those who have mistreated us. And that will do more to defeat Satan than even the most profound religious argument. That's love, Christ's love. And I pray that you and I will be able to exhibit that kind of love too. And I pray that you'll forgive me for all my problems. I didn't think I was going to have this kind of problem. But I'm still quite convinced that if you have a need in your life, a need for prayer, a need to become a Christian, to begin the walk of life, or a need to make your life count in this congregation, I invite you to come and make that known as we stand and as we sing. I do with all my heart. And is he your savior? Do you have a decision you need to make? We invite you to come as we sing this last verse. Please be seated.
This concludes today's worship service. Thank you for listening. We hope you were encouraged by joining us on Facebook Live. Please message us if you have questions or would like more information. May God bless you and give you his peace.